Did you know that the feeling of hunger and satiety is not equally strong for everyone? Some people are fine with not eating for a long time, while others are plagued by hunger shortly after a meal. In this video, I'll explain why and what role your genes play in this. Hunger is an important process that drives us and our animal cousins to search for food. While we went hunting with bows and arrows in the Stone Age, today a short trip to the fridge is enough. In order for us to not be immediately hungry again after a meal, but to be increasingly reminded to look for food again after a longer fasting period, we have specific genes that precisely regulate the intensity of hunger. However, these genes are not flawless. Therefore, some of us are more plagued by hunger than others. Let's take a closer look at this. When a person eats a meal, nutrients enter the stomach and later the small intestine, where they are absorbed into the bloodstream. The small intestine recognizes the nutrients and begins to suppress the feeling of hunger. One interesting thing here is that dietary fats have little influence on the feeling of hunger, carbohydrates suppress it quickly but only for a short time, and protein works somewhat slower than carbohydrates but for a longer time period. So whatever the person ate, he is full and satisfied after the meal. It can take many hours for a slight hunger to slowly reappear, so everything is quite normal. In fact, the FTO gene plays a role here. It indirectly influences how quickly the feeling of hunger develops again. A properly functioning FTO gene can indirectly ensure that we can concentrate on other things after a meal, but also remember in time when it is time for dinner. But what about people with defective FTO genes? Again, the person eats their meal and is finally full. But this time, the FTO gene isn't working properly, and the person becomes hungry much too soon. The result may be an earlier meal, an occasional snack, and overall too many calories for a healthy body weight. By the way, there are some strategies for keeping hunger in check. For one, it can be helpful to eat several small meals instead of three larger ones. This keeps the stomach busy, and as long as this doesn't lead to consuming more calories overall, excessive hunger can be controlled. Some foods also suppress hunger. A cup of coffee, for example, is effective in quickly combating hunger. We all know the feeling of hunger, but it seems unfair that some of us are plagued by it more than others just because of our genes. The FTO gene also has another unpleasant consequence. It can make us prefer calorie-dense foods. Let's take a closer look at this process. The FTO gene is a good example of how genes can not only control mechanical aspects of our bodies, but also influence us mentally. In a study involving about 2,700 Scottish children, an interesting experiment was conducted. Each child was asked to fill their plate with whatever they wanted to eat from a well-stocked buffet. Unfortunately, the children were not allowed to eat the meal. The scientists analyzed each plate, noting the total calorie count and the amount of fat, carbohydrates and protein. Next, the FTO gene was analyzed for each child, and the results were astonishing. The children with defective FTO genes had significantly more calories on the plate than those with functioning genes. Apparently, the gene influences which foods we prefer. Interestingly, the FTO gene mainly led to a preference in more fat-rich foods. When a person is hungry and at a buffet, there is a variety of food choices. The functioning FTO gene hardly influences the choice, and only a small amount of particularly fatty foods end up on the plate. On the other hand, if the FTO gene is defective, it suddenly takes control and tempts the person to add more calories in larger quantities to the plate. In addition to the feeling of hunger, there is another important process, namely our feeling of satiety. And here our genes have a say as well. Once hunger has finally won and a meal ends up in the intestine, the development of the satiety process begins. Certain nutrients absorbed in the intestine activate the production of a satiety hormone, which also makes hunger disappear. It signals the body that it has eaten enough and that it's time to stop eating. Again, genes responsible for the development of the feeling of satiety are involved here. And once more, gene defects in these genes have an unpleasant consequence. If the feeling of satiety is developed too slowly due to a gene defect, the affected person has already consumed far too much and overeaten. The consequence, increasing body weight. For this reason, proper control of the feeling of satiety is an essential function of the body to control calorie intake. Let's take a closer look at this process. 
a person has ordered a much too large portion and starts to enjoy eating it. The body recognizes the first nutrients in the intestine and supported by the functioning FTO gene starts to develop the feeling of satiety. Soon it is time to stop eating and the feeling of satiety makes the appetite disappear. Before the plate is empty, the person is full, puts down knife and fork and stops eating. This process has thus protected the body from an unpleasant excess of calories. With defective genes, things look different. The person begins to eat their much too large portion again. Due to defective genes, however, the feeling of satiety starts much too late and is too weak. The person is hungry until the last bite, and after the plate is empty, the feeling of satiety slowly begins to develop. The food coma sets in, and now it slowly becomes clear. That was way too much. A too slow feeling of satiety can thus lead to overeating and therefore an excessive calorie intake. Independently of the genes, there is a simple method to support the body in satiety. Simply give it time. If you eat more slowly, the first nutrients in the intestine have enough time to inform the body that it is almost enough and that you are full before you overshoot the target. So much for the topic of satiety. Next, we will look at the process of how genes can influence our behavior, specifically our tendency to snack frequently. Once we have eaten a satisfying meal, the feeling of satiety sets in and sooner or later, depending on the genes, the hunger disappears. But what happens until the next main meal is also influenced by genes. Certain gene defects tempt us to snack more frequently than people with optimal genes. People with optimal genes statistically tend to eat fewer snacks between main meals. If these genes are defective, people are more likely to have frequent snacks. But snacking behavior is also influenced by other habits. Hunger suppressing coffee drinking, distraction at work or the lack of time for snacking also help reduce snacks even with defective genes. So not everyone with defective genes can actually observe this tendency in themselves. However, studies have shown that people with the gene defect statistically snack more frequently than those with optimal genes. If these are low calorie snacks or if main meals are divided into several smaller meals, there is no problem. However, if the snacks consist of additional chocolate bars, the genetic temptation can easily lead to a calorie surplus. So be careful. In most of the genetic traits discussed so far, the FDO gene is involved. In fact, this gene is considered one of the main culprits in obesity. Studies have shown that the genetic defect in the FDO gene alone, through the described defects, leads to an average 3 kg higher body weight. In addition, the number of cravings is also doubled by this genetic defect. So if you have this defect, there's a good chance that you're carrying around 3 kg of extra fat. But how common are such genetic defects in the FDO gene? As with most human genes, everyone has two of them, one inherited from the father and one from the mother. 46% have two functioning genes and are optimally protected. 41% have one functioning and one defective gene, and 13% have two defective FDO genes. Both types have an increased feeling of hunger, tend to prefer fatty foods, have a weak feeling of satiety and snack more frequently. For this reason, these two types, as mentioned, have an average of 3 kg more fat mass than people with optimal genes. Besides the FDO gene, there are other genes involved in the discussed effects and are analyzed as part of a comprehensive gene analysis. This also applies to the next effect we will examine in detail, fat distribution in the body. Excess fat can be deposited in various places in the body. Women tend to carry these fat deposits around the hips, while men often have them in their abdomen. Although both are aesthetically undesirable, there's a crucial difference. Fat in the abdomen, distributed around the organs, is called visceral fat. And compared to hip fat, this abdominal fat is metabolically active and particularly unhealthy. While gender already provides a tendency for fat storage, there are a number of genes that influence the preferred storage location for fat. With optimal genes, unhealthy abdominal fat is largely prevented and reserves are necessarily stored around the hips. With defective genes, this protection is lost and there tends to be more fat deposits around the organs. Bad news for your health. Being overweight is always unhealthy, but depending on the genes, fat can be deposited in unfavorable places and have a significantly worse impact on your health. So being overweight is thus unhealthier for some people than for others. 